three, two, one. Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted. This is episode 247, the hazy, hot, humid edition. It's September and outside, nobody wants to go. I'm Kevin Carlson. And I'm George Conger. And today, September 8th, 2016. Okay, welcome back to the show. It's been kind of a, a week or two since George and I have sat down. George, you were on vacation. How was it? Vacation's been over for about two weeks now, mm -hmm. Kevin. I've been back at the at the uh, uh, at the church, planning the fall activities, getting everything ready. It's an exciting time. That's good. Yeah, I guess you know when I think about why we haven't taped, I need to blame mom and dad. Oh, let me back up here a little bit. Um, when mom, dad, and her two boys, Kevin and Kent, travel uh, for vacations... Oh, we're we... going to blame your mother and father, not mine. No, no, yeah, my mom and dad. Okay. You know, when we travel on vacations, and it's been like this my whole life, we do it differently. A lot of people go out there, and they have postcard-type moments, and we don't really have those. We have memories from vacations that are are just good stories later on in life. I remember... So you uh, have more mug shots than postcards. More mug shots. I remember vividly, uh, six years old, I was playing in the backyard, lived in La Crosse, Wisconsin, and Dad was planing a door, bzz, 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 and I hear this blood-curdling scream as he had somehow got a sliver all the, all the way up and in his arm. His blood's pouring out everywhere. And I, I come running over, and Mom comes bolting out of the house. What what did her, her her dear hubby do? And she looks at him, and her words were, Not again. Oh, my. I knew my life was set up differently. I knew that I would have different stories, you know, pretty much the rest of my life. Vividly, I remember being in one of these uh, propeller boats in Florida on our Disney vacation. Uh, what are those called again? Airboats. 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 And we had gone all over, and this is like the last day of vacation, and Dad had his new camera, has been taking pictures and pictures of everything, and we are going to have all these pictures that we put in an album and we'd share with our friends and stuff like that. As we're getting off the boat, I get off, Mom gets off, um, my brother Kent gets off, the boat kind of goes a little off the dock. Dad decides it's the time to trip drop the camera into the water oh. and land on the dock and uh nobody wanted to put their fingers into alligator infested waters to retrieve the camera and oh. it's it's not just my my parents it's my brother as well we were traveling um uh, to friend's house somewhere in minnesota and as a young teenage boy he got mad at mom and he stormed off and he was going to go hide in a closet he opens the door slams the door with himself in the closet and we're in the living room, and we hear, dunk, 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 dunk. my brother had actually stepped into the stairwell of the basement, not the closet. It ended up on the uh, the basement floor. And oh. that's just, that's Carlson 101. And so, so what happened in Milford, Connecticut? <laughs> yeah. Well, as um, I told you, mom and dad were coming to town. And usually, and we joke about this, it's a trip to the ER. When, whenever they go somewhere, somebody falls, somebody stumbles, something happens, and um, the, there's an ER visit or a police visit. Mom's first visit to Connecticut, she had her purse stolen at a stop and shop uh, in Waterbury. The Coulson 101, that's how we travel. That's, that's how we roll. So when I arrived to the airport and I saw Mom and Dad in wheelchairs at the curb to be picked up, I didn't go, oh, that's weird. It's not. That's the way we are. Oh. Apparently, mom had tripped while getting off the plane and had uh, torn uh, a tendon in her right knee. And uh, uh, she's going to need surgery. We took her to the urgent care center. Um, and we took her to uh, an hour, hour later to the MRI place where they, they scanned and they verified that, yeah, you have torn uh, ACL and some other things in your knee and your knee surgery. And so, you know, Jill and I, as best I could, 
uh, we kept them here on the beach, had a lot of fun for about a week, and they decided it's time to go back home. But you know, the, the, the kind of the three-week vacation they were going to have here in Connecticut with Mystic Seaport and all that, that didn't turn out. Um, but uh, it, Carlson Vacation 101 happened again. Um, and keep us in your prayers, but this, this is the way we travel. It, it, you know, this is why I got lost in Egypt for eight hours in the middle of the country. It, it's, it's how it works. <sighs> well, let's move on to some news. Um, I guess, you know, you and I didn't have time to tape, but I, I taped a, a show with Peter Old and with Gavin Ashington uh, regarding the uh, new uh, news that there's a homosexual bishop living in England and serving in England. And unique about this is that he um, lives with a person he's in a relationship with. And you and I, we talked about this pre-show. How do we talk about this and say something that the other two guys haven't talked about? And, well, first I want to get your reaction to the interviews. Uh, excellent. Peter o Old gave an overview of the political situation, and Gavin spoke to the moral and profound theological issues at play. And I want to pick up on one of the things that Gavin spoke about, which is the language that is being used here, because that's the problem. Uh, from my perspective, this is not new news. Uh, for going on 20 years now, people have been telling me gay activists, oh, there are a dozen, there are two dozen gay bishops in the Church of England, and if they don't come out, well, we'll out them. Uh, we've heard this for years. And in fact, I think it was 2002, Peter Wheatley, who was a suffragan bishop in London, was outed as a gay man, and he responded, yes, he lived with his partner, but he was celibate, and he was abiding by the Church's teachings. So, Nicholas uh, Chamberlain is not new in that he is... Uh, a uh, man uh, who has same-sex orientation who is serving as a bishop. Um, what is new is that the one of the Sunday newspapers essentially wanted to blackmail him. Give us a story or we'll run it, we'll, you know, we, we won't name you, but everybody will know who it is. Basically, sure. they're going to out him. So uh, Nicholas Chamberlain um, went to The Guardian and told his story. Now, the story was already known to you and to me and to those people who follow closely the Church of England's news. When this man was made a bishop, a suffragan bishop, it was known that this is how his living situation was. We weren't going to out him because we don't do that. And uh, it just wasn't our call to make. But well, it... it, it it wasn't news because we didn't know all the details. Um, I, I want to put this kind of in a different perspective, too. Um, if I, and thank God this will never happen, were mm -hmm. nominated to be a bishop, um, I would be you know, in front of a nomination committee, and they would go, Kevin, we want to nominate you to be a bishop. And I would say, oh, thank you. That's really honorable. Um, I'm not going to make the cut, but uh, um, thank you for the nomination, they would say. I need to tell you something. I'm a heterosexual and I'm attracted to uh, women of the opposite sex um, a lot. It, it's one of my struggles. And they would say, Kevin, that's not a problem. You don't. Oh, no, I, no. Um, but I am attracted. And they, you know, the, the nomination committee would say, yeah, it's no big deal. Anything else we need to know? Well, I'm, I'm in a relationship with one of the women I'm very attracted to. Um, and they would say, well, you don't, no, no, I don't do that. Um, but I, yeah, I'm in a relationship. It's kind of intimate and stuff like that. Um, but, uh, and they would say, well, if you're dating and not a big deal, just don't, you know, I, I won't, don't worry about it. There's one more thing I need to tell you. I'm actually living with the person that I'm attracted to. Um, that's not a big deal. And they would what are you trying to pull here, Kevin? Well, that's way outside the realm of possibility. We're not going to have you uh, a bishop that's nominated going forward who's actually uh, living with a person that they're sexually attracted. No, 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 no. And I think that's what's different here, George, is 
um, the scenario Kevin, what itself. Kevin, what you're, the scenario you're describing was actually a 1970 sitcom called Three's Company. Jack and Burke. oddly enough, Don Knotts, the landlord, could also play in the modern version, the Archbishop of Canterbury. They both have the same size neck uh, <laughs> and dress sense. But, you know, that the premise of Three's Company was there was a heterosexual man pretending to be homosexual so that the landlord would let him live with two desirable single women. And they continued double entendres and uh, mm -hmm. uh, things of that nature were the premise of a rather light comedy. It's unfortunate. So that the, that Church, of England is, the, the Church of England is a sitcom? I, yes, I, I, gotta, I have to agree with you. It is a light comedy. Yes. Now... Now, let, let, let's sort of, there have been charges thrown out in the newspaper that conservatives are hypocrites, that uh, why, Kevin and George, if you knew this, why didn't you speak up? If everybody knew this, why was this important? Well, because uh, predilection towards sin, temptation is not sin, okay? If you are tempted, but you do not act upon the temptation, I am not going to condemn you because you are living according to the teachings of the church. You're trying to be a good and faithful person uh, in spite of it all. Now, what's this difference between this and Jeffrey John? You remember the whole Jeffrey John affair? He was a gay man who was partnered, and he too said he was celibate, and he too was appointed bishop, but Rowan Williams forced him to back down. The difference was Jeffrey John said, I'm now celibate, but I, used, I wasn't always, and I don't feel any need to repent. And in fact, I want the church to change its teachings. Nicholas Chamberlain, the Bishop of Grantham, is not propounding the church change its teachings. He's saying he's living in accordance with them. But as Gavin mentioned, the problem is the man's vocabulary. He self-identifies with gay, as being gay. Now, in our context, and for the vast majority of Americans and Brit Britons and all of the world, when you say you're gay, that presumes that you're sexually active. Now, to say that you're gay and celibate, uh, it's almost, if we're going to go into the, uh, to the world of sitcoms, it's like saying that you're uh, a sadomasochist but nonviolent. Mm. Um, it we need their definitions of terms do not conform with reality what does it mean to be gay it does it mean to okay. be sexually active does it mean right right now people are thinking there's a her uh, earthquake going on in florida you 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 you're kicking your desk so let's sit no, no, up no, straight the cat, the cat. Oh, the cat okay it was the cat who came out to tell me that uh, it's time to go outside <laughs> oh, okay and you slouched a little in the last couple of minutes a little higher. Oh, oh, there you go. A, this oh, is a, people don't know oh. this. This is our second taping, and we're we both kind of by the second taping we're a little casual. So, and I, we we have to agree the definitions here are are undefined. Yeah, yeah I, what does he mean by gay? What does he mean by relationship? What does he mean by yes? He's living with uh, a person he's partnered with. You know. Uh, because it's part of and it's part of a wider problem in Western culture of the destruction mm -hmm. of male friendship. Mm -hmm. No one would have a, perhaps there are a few kooks who would presume that uh, Sherlock Holmes and Doctor Watson, Doctor Watson, were gay because they lived together. They were two unmarried men, and you know the new the new reincarn reincarnation of that TV series Sherlock that has one of the running jokes. People assume that they're gay because they sure. live together, and they're not. Um, yet the culture is moving so that male friendship is being cast in terms of genital sexual relationships. And was it wise for the Bishop of Grantham to describe himself? Was it wise for the Archbishop of Canterbury to go forward in the midst of this t difficult time without having these things understood and cleaned up and straightened out? And that's where I think the big mistake was made. We we talked about uh, uh, Jeffrey John, and you know, Rowan Williams said, "Hey, I have been known to agree with the the, the uh, gay agenda, but my uh, duties as Archbishop outweigh that." 
Mm. The office is more important. The doctrine of the Anglican Communion and holding it together for the right reasons um, means that I need to ask you to step down. And he did. He, he, mm. was, he stepped down. Archbishop Welby has a different idea here because all this was hidden. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and in hiding all this, you've created um, a place within a, a church now where you nobody know, trusts anybody. You, you've lost that, that realm of trust. How much do I trust the Archbishop of, of Canterbury now? Um, not very much because he's willing to hide things um, that we would find unpleasant in the communion. That's not mm-hmm. how it works. We're and transparent, is it- we're open. And is it healthy to have a situation where there are a dozen purportedly gay bishops in the Church of England that gay activists know all about, that you and I know some of these people, who are teaching and preaching and deliberating on these issues without declaring their interests, without sort of a clarification? Now, David Hope, for instance, the former Archbishop of York, famously said his sexuality was a gray area. Um, what, so is, this is not a new issue, but I think that the church, this, the old boy system of promoting people who won't rock the boat, who are like us, well, it's his turn and, you know, he's part of our group, has not served the church well. It's, yeah. it's, created a, it's created a culture of factionalism and cliqueishness and, okay, we need to have 12 women bishops, so we'll not choose people who are called to be bishops, but the next 12 slots we'll give to women. Sure. Uh, we need to have so many gay, celibate Anglo-Catholics, okay? It's their turn. Um, when you play that sort of game, you're not really being faithful to Christ's teaching as it's outlined in the New Testament, what a bishop is. You're playing identity politics. You are. It's one of those interesting things because we currently have the situation where you approach and go, how did he become a bishop? When in reality, you should be looking at a person and say, of course, he's a bishop. That's the difference that really exists when we look in the New Testament for a person who is above reproach. Um, and, you know, we need to start doing that a- again in the church. Uh, what, George, we're up against uh, our I, time I, limit I, here. I, okay, quickly, I think, sure. What, just to want to add, what makes it even more difficult is that evangelicals like me regard bishops as necessary evils. In other words, bishops are something, well, we should or should have them. So, but the a minister's job is focused on the parish level, so that, um, and that focus of importance. Uh, why is uh, Nicky Gumbel not a bishop? You're one of the most outstanding priests of his generation. Well, because he's an evangelical, and his focus is on a di- what is important to him is different than what is important to the company men who make up the vast majority of bishops of the Church of England. So my team doesn't help the situation by spurning uh, the office or by downgrading its importance, while some of the other players in this uh, game put too much importance into it. Um, at, well, it's screwed up. How's that? It is. Of course it is. <laughs> That's why I enjoy that you know, like the places like the... Uh, American Anglican Council are teaching again what it means to be a bishop. I think that's going to be a helpful ministry because over 2,000 years, we have certainly forgot. Okay, we just pushed 18 minutes. Guys, go enjoy your weekend. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm George Conger. And you've been watching episode 247 of Anglican Unscripted.